Thank you, Patrick, for that welcome. Thank you, Ben, for leading us in song. Uh, as he said, I'm super glad to be able to gather again another week. It's always good to, to gather together. Um, you know, we made a decision a number of months ago that on this date we would move back inside, which aren't you so glad we did on this beyond gorgeous day? <laughs> um, it will be cold and rainy soon, I'm sure. But um, nevertheless, good to be with you all, church. I'm, I'm thankful. I really am grateful to gather. Um, by now, most of you know that uh, it is very likely Joe Biden will be the 46th president of the United States. Um, 140 years ago when our church started, Rutherford B. Hayes was the 19th president of the United States. And in between the 19th president and the 46th president, our church has done one thing consistently, and that is stand on the Word of God. So what am I going to do? I'm going to preach the Word of God. And we are going to lean into his truths, we are going to stand upon his word, and we are going to place our hope in the fact that Christ is on his throne. He is not unaware, uncertain, and uh, caught off guard by anything, church, and so right now we have an opportunity to display the hope of the gospel that we have in Christ. Amen? Um, I'll update you on our morning. We had an exciting morning this, time, uh, this morning. A number of you gathered with us at the abortion clinic off Lake Bloom Trail, and um, we had conversations with a couple moms and saw them choose life. While they were pulling up, they decided, no, I'm going to pursue life for my baby. Uh, and so we took them to get a free ultrasound, connected them then with resources to provide for them on this next chapter of life. And so, man, we were ecstatic to, to see that unfold. Uh, if the presence of the church was not there, they would have walked right in. And so the church has a purpose in this man, and I don't care what rules, laws, regulations you put in place, ultimately the heart is what needs to be changed, and ultimately Jesus is the only one who can change that. And so we have that responsibility, church, to take the gospel uh, to the hearts of men and women. Amen? All right. Amen. So uh, I'll also give you this update, and while we were there, um, that happened, and then at one point a, a guy dropped his girlfriend off left the clinic, um, came back, and we noticed the same car coming back, all right? Uh, and, and they drive right, right by us, and we saw that the gentleman had a, a firearm on his leg in his car. So we called the police, and the police showed up very quickly. Four units, cops ran out, rifles drawn, ran into the, the clinic and into the parking lot. And while all of us were kind of stepping back, literally getting behind some trees, all these officers, man, they ran in, and I just couldn't help but see what was happening and thought, I am so grateful for the work of our officers, uh, those who put their life on the line, the bravery they display. So to all the, all the officers in our congregation, those watching online, I'm grateful for you. I'm thankful for you and the work that you do. Um, well, we are going to continue in Hebrews uh, 11. We've been in Hebrews 11 for some time. It's almost like a mini-series within a series, right? A series on faith, this great faith chapter that we've been in. Um, so you can be turning there. Uh, one, one time, there was a, a, prophys a, prophys professor, a physics professor uh, teaching on the mathematical formula behind the pendulum swing, right? Showing that the pendulum swing always results in an ever-decreasing swing to the point where it stops. Right, so proved that on the whiteboard, showed it on paper to his students. Uh, then he walked over to a long rope that held, you know, hung from a high ceiling, and he attached a bowling ball to the end of the rope. And then he brought it all the way back to a wall to where he stood and put his back up against it, stood on a high stool and put the bowling ball to his chin. And he said, according to my calculations, according to the math, this bowling ball, when it's released, should come back and almost touch me but not quite. So he said, all right, do I have a volunteer then? I don't want to do this. Can I have a volunteer to come and release this bowling ball? And nobody wanted to do it. None of the students volunteered. Even though they had seen the proof, they had it on paper, they knew the outcome. They didn't want to risk their chin getting hit by a bowling ball. Church, as we make our way through Hebrews 11, as we walk through Scripture, I don't want us to be the kind of people who look at faith and read about faith and affirm faith and talk about faith and learn about faith, but we don't ever actually walk in faith, right? We need to be people who are willing to step into the arena. If you've noticed, we've, we've seen every week there's an action step 
involved. Noah built the ark, right? Uh, Abraham left his homeland, went to a foreign land. Jacob blessed his sons. Those are all verbs. Faith requires obedience and action. So we want to step into that, uh, into that route, if you will. We want to move forward in our faith and not just be people giving lip service to it on the sidelines, okay? So Moses will be our, our, our focal point tonight, the life of Moses as we go verses 23 through 29. So we'll look at those, um, what, seven verses, and, and we'll see in there there's five statements that say, by faith. By faith Moses did this, by faith this. And, and we're gonna break those down, look at each of those. The last two will combine, so really there's four points. That's how we'll navigate through this uh, text, but we wanna see what's the author saying, right? And how is this applied to our life now in 2020? All right, so verse 23, life of Moses, by faith, it says in 23. And I think we have it on the screen this week. Yes, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Pause there. All right, so the first act of faith in Moses' life was not something done by Moses. It was something done to Moses by his parents, right? So parents, now you can kind of put yourself in this, in this story as it kind of unfolds. I want you to be thinking in terms of, you know, what Amram and Jacobed, his mother and father, had to go through as they, uh, as they found themselves in a political situation and a corrupt situation, unlike anything you and I have ever been a part of. We learn about this in Exodus 1 and 2 the situation that Moses was born into, right? We find that Egypt is growing fearful of the growing population of the Hebrews, right? Uh, specifically the males. And so the Pharaoh orders this edict and in Exodus one twenty two, he says, every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. All right, so that's Moses' situation. He's born into, his parents have to deal with that. Uh, and we learn from scripture that his mother hides Moses for three months, right? Three month olds, you know, they, 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 uh, they sleep a lot. So hopefully that was the case for baby Moses. They definitely cry too, but you know, she was apparently able to keep that secret. Moms today would have a really hard time with this, you know, not posting Instagram pictures every 27 seconds, you know, of their new baby, but, but right? Come on, guys. All right, don't be mad at me. Um, but Amram, you know, she kept him a secret for at least three months. And our text says it is by faith that she hid Moses. Seems paradoxical, doesn't it? Aren't we people who don't shrink back? Didn't we learn that? That we're not people who shrink back. We move forward in faith. But, but here it says that, that Amram in faith hid Noah. I mean, Abra or Moses the reason that this is an act of faith is because now not only is Moses' life at risk, now they're placing their life at great danger too. Now they're bringing themselves into a place where they are just as susceptible of the death penalty by Pharaoh because they are defying his orders. So by faith, they enter into that risk. It would be an act of fear if they had conceded to this evil mandate because that would have meant they were trying to gain personal safety and self-preservation instead of actually stepping out. So we see that in faith she hides Moses and she's not interested in self-preservation because she knows ultimately faith calls for self-abandonment and so she goes down to the Nile River, right? the place where Pharaoh had told them to take their babies to drown them. So she takes Moses to the Nile River. But uh, instead of you know, throwing him in the river, she constructs this basket out of papyrus reeds and tar and molds it together and places Moses in it. And in faith, she leaves that basket in the reeds. Parents, are you still tracking? You still thinking, man, how could I ever do something like that? In faith, she understood that her greatest treasure, her greatest possession, her most prized, precious thing in the world was something that she had to walk away from and what happens next well what happens next is not luck it's not coincidence it's God's great chess move it's strategic Pharaoh's daughter comes along finds this baby takes him in 
So the baby that was supposed to die at the hand of Pharaoh was now planted inside the kingdom of Pharaoh like a seed growing every day to the point where he would actually be the one to bring destruction to the house of Pharaoh. What God meant for, what man meant for evil, God takes and uses for good. How did this happen? How did her mom, how did his mom come to this place where she could take that step of faith? She didn't fear the earthly king. She remained faithful to the heavenly king. In that moment, they had to go completely against their parental nature, of holding on to their baby, and they had to trust that God knew better and God had a plan for that little child. They had no idea that you know, he would grow up to be the deliverer of the Hebrew people. They had no idea who their son was going to turn out to be. They weren't motivated by a success story that they had seen on television. They simply trusted God. Faith allows us, church, to hand over those things. Faith allows us to trust God in ways that make absolutely no sense to the surrounding world. So then we see by faith in verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. What does that mean? He didn't even know who Jesus was, right? But this is what the, Hebrew, the author of Hebrews is showing us. He's connecting that with us, showing us that the path of Jesus, the way of the cross, is better. That's always his argument, right? Every week, Jesus is better. And he's showing us that that path of suffering that leads to eternal life is far better than the treasures that this world has to offer. And Moses is a good contrast between the treasures of this world uh, and the things that await in eternity, right? So the end of verse 26 says, he was looking to the reward. So those few verses right there. Remember last week, we we talked about that, you know, how faith sometimes can lead us from the corner office to the third world, right? A third world country. Faith is not always this spiritual ladder or, or progression to a better quality of life. Right, it doesn't always equal you know better circumstances when we walk in faith. In fact, a lot of times it it can be the opposite. It can lead you to the place where the grass is not greener on the other side, the place of desolation that needs nourishment from the gospel. Right? Faith will move people that way. Faith is what moved Jim and Elizabeth Elliot from the comforts of home to Ecuador, if you know the story. It would be the thing that led Jim to give his life for the gospel. Faith led Adoniram Judson. To Burma for 40 years. It led William Carey to India. It led some of you to Raleigh. Right? Faith does not follow the patterns of the world. It follows the plans of God. And sometimes, church, that means we find ourselves at places where we have very hard decisions to make. Just like Moses' parents had a hard decision to make. At one point when Moses grew up, he had a hard decision to make. Because he realized at one point that the people who raised me, the people who brought me in, the people who showed me kindness, the people who made sacrifices so that they could bring in a child and raise him, those people are actually walking in direct contradiction to the ways of God. So what do you do? There's a decision that needs to be made. Our text says that by faith, He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Why is it an act of faith to make a decision to leave behind something that is clearly dishonoring God? Like, shouldn't that just be a no-brainer? Right, like, removed from that story, you and I are like, well, duh, Pharaoh's bad, you know, people of God, good. But put yourself in the situation. It's an act of faith because it requires giant sacrifice on the part of Moses. He doesn't know what the outcome's gonna be. He doesn't know what awaits, right? Faith means that you're taking this step into the unknown and you don't know what the return on that investment is gonna be. But the Bible promises us that when we walk in faith, the ROI there is eternal. It's beyond anything this world can give us. Two things could have prevented Moses from leaving you know, the house of Pharaoh. Two things we wrestle with all the time, comfort and compromise. Moses had it made. He knew 
If he walked away, he'd be walking away from familiarity, from security, from people who loved him, from, from uh, stability, not to mention his entire future. I mean, he was on his way to royalty. Comfort usually leads to compromise, doesn't it? How easy would it have been for him to just compromise, just think, man, my, my biological parents, man, they acted in faith so that I could be here. Who am I to just abandon all of this? I mean, look at what God has blessed me with. How easy it would have been to compromise. But thankfully, Moses realized that his purpose in the midst of his situation was not to blend into the house of Pharaoh, not to compromise, not to justify, but to actually stand against it. See, God has orchestrated this so perfectly. He took this random little baby who Pharaoh ordered to be killed, and he took that little baby and he planted him in that kingdom to raise him up to deliver the Hebrew people from slavery. It's just a little picture, isn't it? As massive as the Exodus story is, it's a shadow in what God was about to do. Because one day God would send another baby on a seemingly insignificant night in an insignificant town. And that baby would grow up to be the one to deliver the people from slavery. But this time, not physical bondage, but spiritual bondage with eternal implications. He wasn't leading the people to the promised land. He was leading them to an eternal kingdom. This is just a picture happening. So how did Moses take that step? How did he make that hard decision? Like his parents made that hard decision. Like Abraham made the hard decision to leave behind everything he knew. Verse 26 tells us he was looking to the reward. His eyes were fixed on that of eternity. He wasn't consumed. He wasn't infatuated with his present situation. He wasn't paralyzed by the fear going on around him. He could see through it. He could see beyond it. Just like Jesus looked at the cross and saw beyond it. He saw resurrection. He didn't look at the cross and think that's the end of the story. He went to the cross knowing what lies behind it. Church, we know what lies behind this. We know what lies behind an election. There is an eternity at stake. That's where our hope is found. So Moses had this eternal perspective. Now, notice in verse 25 and verse 26, there is this contrast going on with eternal and with temporary. It's so important for us to, re to realize this. You know, when you stack them against each other, eternal and temporary, it's like, well, obviously, you know, I want th the things of the eternal. But when you remove them or distance them and you don't put them in front of you every day, it's very easy to just lose sight of eternity and factuate yourself with the, the shiny, you know, the, the here and the now. But look at verse 25 and 26. It says, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. He was looking to the reward. So rather than the here and now, he chose the hard path of obedience in faith, knowing that what lies beyond that is eternity with God. Jesus preached this all over, right? Through, through Matthew, he's always bringing this to our attention. He says, don't fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Eternal, temporary. He said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Eternal, temporary. Heaven and earth will pass away, he said, but my words will not pass away. Eternal, temporary. You see, Moses' faith, our faith, gives us uh, eyes to see the difference between what's temporary and what's eternal. Moses knew that the comfortable uh, disobedience would ultimately lead to destruction. And he had faith and wisdom to see that the hard road of obedience and faith would lead to eternal life. Church, we have to be a people who are looking beyond the here and now, a people who fix our hope on, on Christ because he can actually sustain that hope. If you place your hope on a different object, it will make you, it will drive you crazy. It will leave you disappointed. It will leave you depressed. It will leave you angry. I don't know if anybody in here uh, has been walking around with bitterness in their heart lately or anger in their heart lately toward other people. It's probably because you've taken some of your hope and you've placed it on something that is not able to sustain that hope. Only Christ can sustain that hope. We have to be those people. Verse 27 says, by faith he left Egypt. Not being afraid of the king's anger, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. 
All right, so that moment the author's talking about here is when Moses left Egypt the first time. Uh, It's recorded in Exodus 2. Just listen along. It says, if you know the story, you remember one day, it says, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and he looked that way. And seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? And he answered, who made you prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. So did you pick up on the seemingly contradictory text there? Exodus tells us Moses was afraid, so he left. Hebrews says he wasn't afraid, so he left. Like how do you bring, like how do you make sense of that? Well, ultimately, I think the writer's bringing us to a deeper conviction that that drove Moses, that motivated Moses, that guided Moses. Ultimately, he was walking in obedience according to faith, not fear. Right? The the author is recognizing the, the truth that fear is inevitable for all of us. Like his parents had fear when the government was seeking to kill their little boy. Like, make no mistake about it. To walk in faith doesn't mean we're just ignorant to the fact that the sinful realities are around us. But Moses' parents did not make decisions based on fear. Moses didn't make a decision based on fear. Ultimately, deep in both of them, his parents and within him, there is a motivation, a driving factor of faith. Yeah, they were scared. We don't need to pretend that they weren't scared. Of course they were. But we have to make that decision when those fears creep in. Am I making my decisions in life based on the fear of man, the fear of failure, the fear of the unknown? Am I just making every decision along my way based on what the outside circumstances say? Or am I bringing those things to attention but then moving forward in faith? That's what Moses did here. He left Egypt in faith. So yes, Moses Moses left because he didn't want to die. But he also left knowing that God wasn't finished with him. See, faith gave him the patience on the other side when he went to Midian to wait on God. From that point on, Moses could have easily just disappeared from the pages of Scripture. He messed up, boom. He left town never to be heard of again. But that's not how the story goes. Because Moses didn't run away in fear. See, fear gives you every reason why you're disqualified. I talked to the Hemp Hill family, who is a family in our church who sold everything, moved to Africa. One of those stories. They have six kids. They moved to Africa, came back, started their life over. Then they sold everything again (laughs) and moved back to Africa. I'm like, who does that twice? You know what I mean? But that's what they did. And they told me the other night, they said, man, it's, it's amazing that people think missionaries are these superheroes. We are, we are just the most normal people moving forward in faith. Sure, there's details and things to work out, but we're no different. I said, man, that's, you're exactly right. Sometimes we build people up like that to be these, these mountains and these heroes, and we're like, oh, I can never do that. But God's showing us every step of the way that he's not taking the superstars He's taking the ordinary people who are putting their yes on the table and then he's moving them forward in these baby steps in faith. So Moses goes to Midian. He went from a prince to a peasant real quick. But his response was not, I guess God forgot about me. I guess I sinned too much. I guess I messed up the plan that God had for my life. It's all over from here. Moses at least knew that God wasn't finished. He was still burdened. Every day Moses thought about the injustice happening under Pharaoh. So the story moves forward. Verse 28 says, By faith he kept the Passover, sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. Can you imagine like trying to convince people of this? I mean, seriously. We know the story, but like, if some dude came over to my house and said, you gotta paint this blood over your door, man. Like, so the destruction angel won't come. I'd be like, 
calling the police. You know what I mean? Like, that's crazy. But Moses, in faith, acted like this crazy person when he went and obeyed the word of the Lord, telling these Hebrew people, this is how you get the angel of death to pass over. Faith does that. (laughs) By faith, verse 29 says, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. You see how it's come full circle? Pharaoh's mandate to drown these Hebrews, Hebrew males was actually a judgment on his own household. His army would actually, actually be the ones ended up, who would end up being drowned. So from, from 28 and 29 kind of show us Moses' life on the other side of Midian. So the first 40 years or so of his life, he's living in luxury. I mean, has it made, has whatever he would like. Second 40 years of his life, he's on the back side of the desert tending sheep for his father-in-law, right? Like thinking every day, I'm wasting my life. Probably thinking every day, man, if I had just kept my mouth shut or if I had just turned the other way, man, this isn't worth it at all, right? Probably wrestling through some of those doubts that creep in when you follow God and things don't always turn out to be better on the other side. There's probably a lot of that doubt going on. But that's the season that God is molding Moses while his 40s are ticking by and his 50s are ticking by and his 60s and his 70s are ticking by, he's thinking, I never did a thing with my life. (laughs) And then when he's 80, God says, okay, now it's time. The age that our culture says, all right, sit down, do nothing. You've worked hard enough. Just cruise. That's when he called Moses. And he said, all right, now it's time to go stare down Pharaoh. It's time to go lead over a million people out of slavery. It's time to go cross through the Red Sea. By the way, they're gonna complain and they're gonna rebel most, most times, Moses. But those 40 years, he had to unlearn everything he had just learned the first 40 years. He had to know what it meant to walk in absolute faith. You see, he took leaps of faith here and there, but he would have to learn in those 40 years how to walk in faith and the monotony and the normal rhythms of life. Most of our lives are lived out on these 24 cycles where not a lot of exciting things happen. But those are the moments God is building our faith so that when some of these big moments come, we are able to say and see in faith, I can take that step because God's been maturing me. God's been refining me. God's been sharpening me. God's been teaching me patience and wisdom. That's what he's doing with Moses in the desert in Midian. Over the next, well, probably a week, maybe two weeks, we're going to see a lot more names (laughs) come up. Lots more, a lot of, a lot more stories a lot more evidence of God's faithfulness at work, producing fruit. A lot more evidence that God, God's promises are true. So again, I want us to go through those names next week and the week after and see on paper what God is capable of doing and then be a people who step into that arena. Bailey, if I don't know what personal call God has on your life right now, what what he may be leading you to do. But I do know that faith moves us forward. And it looks oftentimes like little baby steps. And so I want to encourage you to continue taking those little baby steps, putting your yes on the table. When Emily and I adopted a second grade kid, we were scared and it made no sense. And people told us that. But in faith, we said, that's, that's all we can do, God, is move in faith that you have good things in store. Let's be a people who display to the outside world that we're not here to follow the pattern that they want to mark out. We're here to follow the plans of God as people who walk in faith, all right? Let's pray, church.